I get into the sermon, there are a couple things I just want to go back over real quick. I've been asked to bring to your attention. Um, we said goodbye to Gary Crellin yesterday, and one of the uh, things that he did around the church and loved to do is the labyrinth. So today we do the labyrinth, we set it up, and we'll be conducting the labyrinth this week um, as we normally do, but in honor of him. And again, everybody's invited to come and help and participate in that. There are many ways in which you can. Also, too, um, <clears throat> not having Ruth around with us has been, uh, we miss having her here. We're glad she's recovering. But um, Kay Staggs is uh, helping out a lot now with 9th Street and wants to make sure that everybody's aware that we'll begin in November doing our 9th Street mission on Monday nights. So uh, if you have questions would like to be part of that, please see Kay. So as we move into our sermon today, as I prepared for my sermon, a couple of things came to mind. A couple of memories that I had that kind of, uh, that this, this scripture uh, brought back to me. It was 1983, I'm in the sixth grade sitting in Sunday school at a prominent Catholic church in Dallas. Don't hold that against me. It had nothing to do with that. As I'm sitting in the class, the teacher walks in with a book that she says we're going to be studying from this year. It was written by Hal Lindsey and it was the late great planet Earth. Now if you haven't read the book, it was touted as a penetrating look at incredible ancient prophecies involving this generation. Hal Lindsey was using the Bible and unraveling the mysteries therein and pointing out how the world was coming to an end starting in the 70s and finishing in the 80s. For a 13-year-old, hearing this, I became very depressed and despondent. My question was, what's the purpose? What's my, what am I doing here? If we're not going anywhere, if the world's coming to an end, why try? It really messed with my mind. I questioned what the point was, and I questioned why I should try to grow into a good person. Hal Lindsey worked hard to show how the Bible prophecies would, uh, about the end of days were coming true, like I said, in the 1980s and 1970s. And here we are in 2020, and as we look back, as predicted, the world came to an end. Soviet Union invaded Israel. Europe became the revived uh, Roman Empire under the rule of the Antichrist. It was a tumultuous few years, wasn't it? Now, if you're sitting there looking at me like, what are you talking about? Obviously, that stuff didn't happen. Hal Lindsey wrote a book about all this was going to happen, and none of it came to pass. Likewise, March 26, 1997, the San Diego Sheriff's Department found 39 people dead, members of the Heaven Gate, Heaven's Gate uh, uh, Society. These folks who believed that an alien spaceship behind the comet Halebop was coming to take them home. How sad for them that the advanced alien technology that was offered was limited so much so that they couldn't collect their alive bodies but only their souls. My answer to that is, sorry, I think I'll wait for the next spaceship that has te teleport technology, or at least a space shuttle to pick me up. Prognostication. Prognostication, the, 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 the prophetic envisioning of what is to come. The fruitless endeavor that predicts when the end and how the end will come. The issues with this practice, while many, a few of them are, first off, getting it wrong. <laughs> if, if, if you're going to make a prediction about the future and get it wrong, that could be a little embarrassing. It could be a little problematic. The problem also is that it breeds disillusionment with the people who follow you. And it reveals the futility of this practice. More importantly, and for us as Christians, the practice of prognostication shifts the focus from the one who deserves our devotion and puts the attention onto somebody else trying to read the tea leaves and to tell you what's coming and what's next. Today, we're going to look at how Paul is dealing with this issue there in Thessalonica and the issue of false prognosticators who think they can divine the future. And what Paul tells the church at that point. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, as we open your word and try to understand what it is you're telling us, we pray that your spirit would guide us and, and direct us, helping us to better understand just exactly what we're called to and how. Help us to see you more clearly. And in seeing you more clearly, loving you more and following you more closely. For this we give you our thanks and our praise in the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> So, prognosticators would have us believe many things which ultimately are just distractions to us. They want to tell us things, they want to get us riled up, they want to get us excited, they want to do things uh, that get us off our focus. And their, and their purpose isn't really to get us off focus, but that becomes the end result of what it is that they do. Paul is directly engaging this issue. He's saying, I get, I hear that there are teachings, rumors, and or letters saying that Jesus has already returned. You have to understand, at that day and age, they believed that there wouldn't be anybody who would pass until Christ returned again. They heard what Christ said, they tried to understand what he said, and they had this understanding that Christ was going to be returning and soon. And that when Christ returned, everybody would be going to heaven. That, you know, all the believers will be taken to heaven. So when they hear that Christ has returned, when, when teachers are coming to tell them that Christ has returned, this created a bit of a fervor in the early church. It created a problem. Can you imagine being in the early church, knowing that Christ is going to return, and then hearing from somebody else, oh yeah, he's already come, and you didn't know about it? For us today, it would be as if Somehow the rapture theology was true. Are y'all familiar with rapture theology? Of course. Some are. <laughs> rapture theology basically states that uh, uh, that there's going to be the, at the end of times the church will be lifted. There are three different times that we, we they argue about: is it going to be pre-tribulation, post, uh, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation? And I'm sure this is all really fascinating stuff for you, but. The church is going to be lifted up. God's going to take the church home. And what's left is going to be subject to the seven years of tribulation. It'd be, it, and that's not something, by the way, that we as Presbyterians or Reformed Christians put any stock into. But it'd be as if today we found out that the, that the rapture of theology was true, that the church was taken up. And guess where, where are we? We're here right now thinking we're church and we somehow missed it. What would that do for our faith and our walk? For me, it put me in a tailspin. I'd be wondering, was I really not the Christian I thought I was? It would be a problem for me. By the way, as a side note, when I left home, I left the Catholic Church, I went into the Baptist Church, just fell in there, and it was a, a comfortable fit, and, and was exposed to all the rapture theology in, in, in a little bit more depth. And, um, and I quickly realized that the end game of rapture theology being taken up just as things get bad is a pretty bad end game. Baptists want everybody to be saved, right? Nothing against Baptists. Baptists want to save everybody. That's just the way they, they operate. And, and here now when they have fertile fields, they're gone. And I got in a little bit of trouble because I said, hey, listen, if that's the case, please leave me so that I can do some good work. And the people I was around said, that doesn't make sense. You can't ask for that. Obviously, I'm not a big fan of rapture theology. The church at Thessalonica was being told that Jesus had returned. And that left the church wondering, well, how is it we missed it? How is it we didn't know that Christ was back? And that created a problem, a problem of identity and a problem of, the, of, their, of, of their faith. It created quite a buzz, and the people thought they somehow missed God's grace. Paul gives them some correction. He says, he says uh, do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, when you receive something that seems to be from us, that says that the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way. And then he goes on to tell them, by the way, there are some things that will pre precipitate his coming, that will, that will come before he comes back. He says, in that time, um, 
this won't happen unless the rebellion comes and the lawless one is revealed. The one who is destined for destruction. This person opposes and opposes all others and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So that he takes the seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Remember, I told you this before. So far, the person who is supposed to come, the Antichrist, hasn't come yet, hasn't seated himself in the temple and made himself God. So therefore, Christ hasn't returned yet. Fear not. Don't worry. It hasn't happened. We today must be cautious. We must be aware. It's our nature to want to see what the future holds. It's our nature to want to know what tomorrow is going to bring, what it will be like. And, and when we hear prognostication, when we hear some sort of prophecy, our ears perk up, we become interested. When you combine that natural proclivity with the Bible's somewhat obscured passages about the future, what you get is all the right ingredients to make all sorts of half-baked notions and ideas about what the end times will look like, when they will be here, and how it will happen. How many here have ever read uh, the Left Behind series? At least one of the books. They tell you, this is all from the Bible. Well, sort of. Half-baked ideas about what the future will hold and, and it captured the nation's attention because we want to know what the future will look like. Let me pose this question to you. What is the benefit of spending tremendous amounts of time and energy to know the how and the when of our days? What's the benefit? Is your faith somehow improved by that? If you knew what the dystopian future was going to look like and when it was going to come, would your faith be any stronger because you knew? How does faith suffer when the dates are proven wrong? We could ask Harold Camping, or anybody who followed him. Harold Camping has predicted the end of times now at least 10 times. I think his number is 12. You know why it's 12 times he's predicted the end, right? Because he keeps getting it wrong. The date comes and passes, and he goes, oh, I must have made a math error, and he goes and corrects it. What happens when you get the date wrong? Let's boil all down, uh, all what this prophecy leads to within the life of a Christian. Do we as believers that love God, do we love God more because we know when things will come to an end? Is our love for God strengthened because we know how things will come to an end? Are we somehow better able to share the gospel when we can know when the end is coming? Are we able to share that good news? No. The answer to all that is no, of course not. Our faith isn't improved. Our ability to share our faith isn't improved. Our sharing of the good news isn't improved. We do touch on people's fears, though. We might get a fear reaction, but is fear as good as love? Do we want people to fear God, or do we want people to love God? So, you say both. And in, in, in uh, Proverbs, we, we read that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom, right? And so, we have to ask ourselves, in this situation, and in Proverbs, what does it mean to fear God? And when we talk about fear here, are we, are we talking about the same thing? No is the answer. By the way, the fear of God is the beginning of all knowledge. But what fear are they talking about? Are we talking about the fear of God that come down and squash you like a bug when you do something wrong? How many here can remember as a kid getting in trouble and mom saying those words we all hated? Wait until your dad comes home. Some of us feared dad because we knew he had a good belt. Some of us feared dad because when he came home and heard what you did wrong, that look on his face was more devastating than anything else. We feared disappointing our father. 
The fear of God as the beginning of all wisdom isn't the fear of a God that is, is powerful and that can squash you. The fear of God is the fear of disappointing God. When I ask about knowing about the end of times and being afraid of what God's going to do, is that as good as love? The answer is no. It's a different kind of fear. The fear there is a fear of how God is going to destroy the world. By the way, it didn't do Noah any good either. Noah tried to tell the world that God was going to destroy the world in the flood. And how many people joined him on that ark? <coughs> Just his family. Fear is not a good motivator. When doctors have a patient in their office and they tell that patient, you need to change your lifestyle, you need to quit smoking, you need to quit drinking so hard, you need to change your diet, or you're going to die in a year, overwhelmingly, they find people don't change their lives. The fear of dying isn't enough to overcome the years of habits and the ways that we cope. Fear is not a good motivator. So the question is, what are we to do? And the answer is fairly simple. Paul tells us in verse 14, For the purpose he called you through our proclamation of the good news, we proclaim to you the good news. And for the purpose of that was that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, he says, stand firm, hold fast to the traditions that were taught to you by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. We're going to hear and, 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 and be informed of how people think the world is going to come to an end. But that's not our aim and our goal. We get no benefit from those kinds of discussions. We get no benefit from prognosticating when the end is going to come. Where we get benefit from is when we share that good news, when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Paul was telling his followers, he says, hold on to what we told you, hold to, to the traditions, and continue on with that. The truth is, the future will happen all on its own. The future is going to happen, and it does not need our pronouncement for it to come true. We don't need to pronounce what predictions are going to happen in order for it to happen. If that were the case, I'd be predicting that I win the lottery tonight. Didn't even have to buy a car or a ticket, it's just going to happen. And if that's all it that needed to happen, then, then fantastic. But it doesn't need my pronouncement for it to happen. So why give all that energy and all that time to making predictions? Our call is to share and work, to share the work of the gospel, to share the good news with other people. So what is that good news? I'm so glad y'all asked. Fabulous. The good news of Jesus Christ, it is the, the death and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. It's the grace of God given to us through Jesus Christ that gives us a right relationship with God. Gives us an eternal relationship in heaven with him and, and a life in abundance with Christ now. That's the good news. That, that despite all of our sins, we are deeply, deeply loved and wanted. That's the good news. So how do we share that good news? Well, that's a fantastic follow-up question. Good job, y'all. How is it that we share the good news? How many people are evangelists? Raise your hand. One evangelist, two evangelists, three evangelists. The rest of us that don't raise your hands, uh, it's not that you don't want to be more than likely. It's more of the question of what in the world are you talking about, evangelist? I'm Presbyterian. <laughs> How do we share the good news? Well, it's very simple. First, we have to live it. You have to believe that God loved you so very much that he gave his only son that you would have life in abundance now and forevermore. God loves you individually that much. And if you believe that, you're going to live it. It's going to be evident in all that you do. You might not be perfect. I'm not perfect, but I'm still going to believe it, and I'm still going to live it, and I'm going to get better at it as I go along. So first, you have to live it. Second, you have to learn how to communicate it. Now, that doesn't mean I need to come up to you and say, do you know about Jesus Christ? Let me tell you about what he did for you and saving your soul. 
If you can do that and do it well, do it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm not one who can do that. I remember being taught as a young man come, uh, in the Marine Corps how to take the Bible and stand on the street corner and talk to people. And it was awful. There was never a time when I stood on that street corner and go, this is exactly where I need to be. This is exactly what I need to do. I was never comfortable. But I didn't mind sitting out talking about that person, getting to know them. And when the opportunity was available, I didn't mind talking about Jesus and who he was to me. We have to learn how to communicate what Jesus means to us. You have to know what Jesus means to you. And if you know that, and if you can articulate that, then you're in the right position when the door opens to be able to share it. So we have to live it. We have to be able to share it. We also have to be able to invite curiosity. When you live your life righteously, when you live your life full of the grace of Jesus Christ, full of Christ's love, it's evident you're not like the rest of the world. And people will be curious. You have to be able to invite that curiosity and be able to spark that curiosity in others. You have to live it. You have to share it. You have to invite curiosity. And then you just need to create relationships. We do our work when we create relationships, when we invite people into relationship with us, or we step into relationship with other people. In those times and in that opportunity, we are sharing the good news. As parents, we're taught very quickly that more is caught than taught. How many of you can remember going down the road with your kid in the backseat and your kid blurting out some, some word that you don't want them saying? And you're realizing very quickly they heard you saying it. More is caught than taught. And that still exists for us today. It is our example that people watch and listen for. We live the good news, and that's a much better example than just speaking the good news. Have to be able to articulate it, but living it is vital. Our efforts not should not be in trying to determine when the end of times are going to happen, reading the tea leaves, dividing the times, that's spending way too much time and energy in an effort that doesn't lead us anywhere into a deeper walk with Christ. That time can be better spent by living the gospel, sharing the good news with others, sharing God's love with others, and the future will happen. It'll happen. We don't have to worry about it. I live my life based on what happened 2,000 years ago on a cross and in an empty grave, not on what might happen tomorrow. And I find I'm much happier for it. We all will be. The world will be much happier for it as well. What's our focus? Jesus Christ. Relationship with God the Father. Not on some future that we don't know exactly what it looks like. To God be the glory now and forevermore. <coughs> Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we don't know what the future holds, what tomorrow looks like, where we're going to be. What we do know is that you're there, and that's where we want to be. Fill our hearts, fill our minds, so that our focus is always on you, on living as you call us to live, and not worrying about what tomorrow brings, because we know that yesterday you gave it all so that we could be in this relationship with you. For that, we say thank you. We praise your name now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, tomorrow is Veterans Day.